Hey there, thank you for joining us at Reprogramming Mind. Today we're going to hear about a couples therapist named Mona DeCoven Fishbane. She is the author of Loving with the Brain in Mind, Neurobiology and Couple Therapy. And in this fast-paced, value-packed interview, she shares insights about the vulnerability cycle, the neurobiology of love, the benefits of reframing, and also shares how couples therapy works with a couple that's on the edge of divorcing. And then at the end, there's a question-answer period. All right, let's go. For those of you who are watching, think back to when you fell in love, if you were lucky enough to fall in love. It's quite a delicious experience. It's an altered brain state. It turns out that it activates the same brain areas as cocaine. Um, researchers put crazy in love folks into the fMRI machine and had them look at a picture of their beloved and what lit up were the reward circuits and dopamine was flowing. Dopamine is the, is the uh, chemical of I want you, I need you. I personally fell in love in a castle. It was the student union in the university where my husband and I met and fell in love. And when we were in love in that early phase, I saw him and me in what we used to call technicolor, full color, and the rest of the world faded to black and white. The reward centers of my brain were very active and very happy. When we're madly in love, researchers have found, and the critical judgmental parts of our brain are turned off or turned down. We don't necessarily see the flaws. When I came into my husband's room in his apartment, his papers and books were strewn everywhere. He's a scholar. I thought, he's not like my neat, controlling father. I was smitten. Guess what we've been fighting about for the past 47 years? Well, it turns out that while he wasn't like my neat, controlling father, I was. <laughs> but this crazy in love state doesn't last long. Love evolves into a saner brain state called companion in love, assuming one doesn't break up. We wake from the trance and our critical judgmental faculties come back online. We see each other, warts and all. Research shows that generally passionate love lasts from 18 months to about three years. Then it yields to companionate love in long-term relationships and an attachment relationship that if they have children allows for co-parenting. Relationship satisfaction tends to deteriorate over time. Time has a corrosive effect on love. Both passionate and companionate love deteriorate. This is made worse by stress, especially in, or including having children. When crazy in love fades, some people, missing their hit of dopamine, seek the high elsewhere through an affair or divorce and remarriage. But eventually, the new relationship is likely to settle down as well. So the question we face is, can love last? Stephen Mitchell wrote a wonderful book called Can Love Last? The Fate of Romance Over Time in 2003. He notes that passion depends on uncertainty, novelty, and adventure. But long-term love relationships rest on security, commitment, and stability. Some of you may be familiar with Esther Perel's book, Mating in Captivity. She built on Stephen Mitchell's work and in a beautiful way. These two forces for passion and desire on the one hand and predictability and security on the other hand are often at odds. Stephen Mitchell points out that our need for security is in fact based on an illusion. He says, love by its very nature is not secure. We keep wanting to make it so. Indeed, building a lasting love relationship requires an acceptance that one cannot have one's partner, nor can one have lasting guaranteed security. You can't have it in that tight way. Rather, an appreciation of the delicacy and fragility of love is called for. Intimacy over time involves an awareness of the fragility of love and the need to nurture it intentionally, and that's what I'll be talking about a lot. It involves respecting the otherness of the other. There's a bit of a paradox because intimacy, which we think of as closeness, involves tolerating differences and allowing for space between what Buber called the I and the thou, myself and the other. Contrast that with a woman who follows her, house around, her husband around the house all day trying to force him to talk to her. Intimacy isn't flourishing there. Cultural beliefs about love and intimacy can erode culture, couple satisfaction. We have in our culture happily ever after as a belief system, entitlement to be loved, values of individualism and competition, especially in the United States culture, which really, I think, set up couples for difficulties in their relationship. In more traditional cultures where there's arranged marriages, interestingly, marital satisfaction does not erode in the same way. I think the expectations around love are actually different. So let's go from the lofty heights of I and thou to the nitty gritty molecules of love in our brains and our bodies. What are the chemicals of love? Helen Fisher, who is an evolutionary anthropologist at Rutgers, did some research on this. She was one of the people who put the madly in love folks in the fMRI machine. She identified the chemicals of love. First and foremost is lust. 
So from an uh, evolutionary point of view, what you want to do is get your genes into the next generation. And in order to do that, you have to have sex, right? So to have sex, you need lust. And testosterone fuels lust for both men and women. For women, there's other hormones as well, but testosterone is a major player for both. The next component is romantic love. It's fueled by dopamine. That's that I want chemical. Norepinephrine, which focuses on that special someone. Oxytocin, which is the bonding attachment hormone. Now, oxytocin is a really important player in couples' relationships. We'll be talking about it. Oxytocin, among other things, is released when you have an orgasm. And Helen Fisher says, be careful who you sleep with because you may fall in love with them. Oxytocin is that, that afterglow after sex is, uh, is oxytocin or release. And it bonds lovers. Oxytocin also lowers cortisol, the stress hormone. So um, a lot of the good qu the qualities of happy couples, including lovemaking, uh, release oxytocin, which lowers the stress hormone. And then finally, we have the attachment hormones of, again, oxytocin and vasopressin, the cousin of oxytocin. Let's talk about intimate relationships and health. Relationships get under our skin. Happy love relationships are associated with good health, including cardiovascular and immune functioning and longevity. Oxytocin is flowing. Unhappy couple relationships with lots of cortisol and low oxytocin are associated with poor health, depression, and earlier death. Marital tension, and when I use marital, I also mean you know, non-married long-term couples. That tension negatively affects cardiovascular, immune, and chronic inflammation functioning. Chronic stress even can shorten telomeres, which are the protective coatings at the end of your t uh, chromosomes, resulting in premature aging and mortality. So the stakes are very high, actually. Couples co-regulate or co-dysregulate each other emotionally and physiologically, for better or worse. John Gottman found that happy couples in conflict don't get as physiologically or, or psychologically dysregulated when they're fighting as unhappy couples do. So it's not that happy couples don't fight, they do, but they're not as dysregulated or as flooded. There are many different definitions of intimacy, and different cultures have different assumptions about intimacy. When we're intimate with someone, we let them in, both sexually and emotionally. I'll focus mostly on emotional intimacy in long-term relationships. What facilitates intimacy? What blocks it? And what can interpersonal neurobiology add to our understanding of intimacy? Some of you may have seen the movie Avatar. It's one of my favorite movies. And in this Avatar world, two people who are in love look at each other and they say, I see you. I see you is a way of noticing and affirming your being. So do you remember falling in love? That question I asked you before. Looking deep into your lover's eyes. Perhaps seeing yourself reflected back is so special wonderful, beloved. When I fell in love, I fell into my lover's eyes and I did see myself reflected back in those eyes as special. Years later, you may look at your partner's eyes and maybe see yourself reflected back as less than wonderful. Maybe there's some hostility there. Or maybe you've stopped looking at each other altogether. Research shows that eye contact is absolutely necessary for intimacy. Our devices take us away from eye contact and from intimacy. We see our partner, to, the goal is to see our partner with fresh eyes as opposed to being stagnant and taking each other for granted. Now, by the way, when I say we, eye contact is necessary for intimacy, if a person is blind, there are other ways to establish intimacy, but in general, it's really important. Do we see our partner as they are or through our lens of transference, expectations, disappointments, and reactivity? Let's talk about vulnerability. Intimacy requires vulnerability. We are interdependent. When you're vulnerable, can you lean on your partner and be held and protected? <clears throat> can you risk letting down your guard? Is your partner there for you? Or does your vulnerability lead you to attack and shut down with your partner? We live in a culture that is suspicious of vulnerability. The messages are be independent, protect yourself, look out for number one. And again, these messages are not helpful for couple relationships. There's an innate tension between attachment on the one hand and self-protection on the other. At the heart of intimacy, there's a neurobiological tension between our need to bond and attach on the one hand and our instinct for self-protection when we feel unsafe on the other hand. Fight or flight undermines intimacy, but it's built into our biology. I'm focusing on non-violent couples, but even in non-violent couples, when partners feel criticized or attacked, their brain registers danger. As we will see when the couple I'm going to be talking about, Lisa and Eric, when Lisa criticizes Eric for being distant, his emotional brain flashes danger and he flees. When he flees, Lisa feels endangered and her, flight in her fight instinct takes over. They do fight flight. 
Their unproductive cycle of her criticizing him withdrawing has eroded their intimacy. We'll come back to them. Let's talk about fight or flight. We're wired to protect ourselves when threatened. This is about survival. The amygdala deep in our brain is constantly assessing for safety or danger. When it assesses danger, it sets off the fight or flight response or the freeze response in dire situations. The amygdala isn't smart. It doesn't differentiate between a poisonous snake in the woods and your grumpy spouse in your living room. So it, it gets reactive. It gets you reactive, even if it's not really life-threatening danger. The amygdala also holds old, old emotional memories, and this is really important. When you get activated in your current relationship, there's a double whammy of the amygdala. When the current moment is triggering old emotional memories, and often we get stuck in our intimate relationships in exactly the place we were stuck as kids with our parents or our siblings. And so we get that double whammy because the amygdala is holding those old early memories as well. And they're unconscious generally. Couples dances of criticize, defend, attack, withdraw are dances of fight or flight. Unhappy couples turn against each other or turn away from each other. And couples in distress, as we said, are awash in cortisol. Mutual hurt and reactivity erode intimacy. I'm going to be talking in a little while about the vulnerability cycle in which we look at how each person's attempts to protect themselves wounds the other. Cycles of reactivity are fueled by our neurobiology, as we'll see. The brain is biased toward the negative. We tend to overlook the positive. We take each other for granted, but love needs to be nurtured intentionally. In addition to fight or flight, we have tend and befriend. This is Shelley Taylor's work. She's a psychoneuroimmunologist in California. We're wired to connect with others and to care for them. That's part of our mammalian heritage. We need others throughout life. We have what I call the protective urge. Gottman found that happy couples turn toward each other, nurture positivity, don't get nasty when they fight, and they repair readily and well. They're friends, they respect each other, and they convey this readily. Rather than watching my back with my partner when I'm in fight or flight, I, if I feel like my partner has my back, I can trust my partner. And Gottman has shown, and others have shown, that trust is key in close relationships. Trust is built through repairing moments of hurt or disconnection. We'll come back to that. It's not like relationships are all easy or positive. There's a lot of hurt moments in relationships, and how we deal with that hurt is really important. Couples come to therapy with a sense of failure, often blaming each other. They often feel disempowered and don't know how to get through to each other and are caught up in reactivity. In circular dances of blame, defensiveness, attack, counterattack, or withdrawal. Gottman found that distressed couples get physiologically dysregulated, flooded, unable to think straight or calm down. He called, the, he called this DPA or diffuse physiological arousal. They're awash in cortisol. Unhappy couples have a high sense of me as opposed to we, each protecting the self from the other. Many moments of nasty, nasty interchanges in Gottman's language lead to a cascade towards distrust and betrayal. Unhappy couples are doing a lot more fight or flight than they are tender befriend. Gottman's research shows that these couples are hung up on the negative, don't notice the positive, and are stuck in cycles of emotional reactivity. There's a lot of mutual blame, each one feeling like a victim of the other. And these unhappy couples are engaged often in power struggles, a kind of win-lose view of marriage. Cultural factors are often fueling the dance of blame. We live, I think, in a blame culture, especially these days. The amygdala tends to hijack the brain when we're very upset and the prefrontal cortex, our higher brain, shuts down. We then rationalize our emotional reactivity. So it's, we, get, we get upset, and then we have to find a reason who to blame, and often we blame our partner uh, and justify our own behavior. Uh, neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga calls this the interpreter. It's in the left prefrontal cortex. And basically, we need to make, we are narrating creatures. We need to make a story up about why we just acted so badly, and often we blame our partner for that. I do that a fair amount in my marriage. Couple reactivity is driven by old emotional memories stored in the brain that are re-triggered in the current moment. As I said before, older experiences, especially with our family of origin, leave marks on our brain and bodies that affect how we react currently. As Dan Siegel and Hartzell said, people may become lost in familiar places as they reactivate old patterns of defense, and then partners get caught up in what I call a dance of amygdalas. We become victims of our own reactivity which I call a tale of two roads. The high road, low road language I got from Joseph Ledoux, who's one of the major writers uh, and researchers on the amygdala. Uh, let's talk first about the amygdala a little more. First of all, the amygdala is online at birth. It, is, it has been called fear central. It's always scanning for danger, assessing every moment for safety or danger. So you walk into a room and you're always checking out, is this a safe place? You're walking on, on a street at night. You're walking into your living room. You know, I have couples who say, when I walk in the door, I'm, I don't know whether my partner is going to be in a bad mood. Right. So they're already their amygdala is, 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 is ready for action. Right. And usually uh, 
more, more biased towards the negative. For survival's sake, we are biased towards fear. We notice the negative. John Gottman found that in happy couples, they have a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions. And Rick Hansen has suggested, and he may have, I don't know if, if he's talked about this on these, web, on these webinars, but he suggested that maybe the reason for that is because the brain is so biased towards a negative that it doesn't, it needs five positives to outweigh that one negative. I, I think he's got, he's onto something there. I think it's really important. So we need to look for the positive. The amygdala is about survival. As Ledoux says, it's wired to preempt the need for thinking about what to do. And indeed, the amygdala will save your life. If you're hiking in a forest and you see a snake um, and you don't know what kind of snake it is or if it's really a snake or a stick, you would be wise to get out of there as opposed to obsess about is it a snake or a stick or take out your book and look at what kind of snake it is because you could be dead by that time. So the amygdala doesn't dabble in niceties. It really works quickly. It sets off the fight, flight, or freeze response by activating the sympathetic nervous system and the HPA axis, which release norepinephrine and cortisol, stress hormones. The muscles become tense to run away or fight, and our whole body is mobilized to meet the danger. The amygdala acts in what Ledoux calls a quick and dirty manner, very fast before we're conscious of it. So it's much faster than the prefrontal cortex. And dirty refers to the fact that it's imprecise and often inaccurate. And that comes up a lot in couple relationships. There is an overlap of present and past that where the amygdala again gets activated on the basis of past issues. And uh, we'll look a little bit at the end about how to address some of that in couples therapy. But the amygdala sometimes gets a bad rap. It's not only about negative and, uh, and fight or flight. The amygdala is also involved in positive emotions, empathy, trustworthiness, and assessment of trustworthiness. So we don't want to get rid of the amygdala. We need to learn to regulate it with our higher brain. There are connections, interconnections between all parts of the brain and certainly between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. But the problem is, as Ledoux has pointed out, is that there's more connections going up from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex than from the prefrontal cortex down. So it's much easier to get emotionally overwhelmed and to see red than it is to maintain your cool and maintain your calm. So a lot of the work I'll be talking about a little later is about how do you maintain your calm? How do you hold on to your best self? The middle prefrontal cortex is not fully complete, not wired completely and functioning completely until the mid-20s, 25-ish. It's responsible for response flexibility, self-regulation, self-soothing, judgment, thoughtfulness, self-awareness, social cognition, and moral behavior. And it calms the amygdala. So couple therapy, I think all therapy actually, whether whatever your the theoretical orientation involves strengthening the ability of the prefrontal cortex to calm the amygdala in both people. Happy couples can self-soothe when aroused or upset. People who are prone to depression or violence, research shows, often have a prefrontal cortex that fails to inhibit or calm the amygdala, either because their amygdala is hyperactive or their prefrontal cortex is underactive. There are also individual differences in the ability of the prefrontal cortex to calm the amygdala. There are individual stress, individual differences in stress reactivity related to the oxytocin receptor gene. So some of this is, is genetic, but nurture matters also. So trauma, especially early in childhood, can result in a hyperactive amygdala and an underactive prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, which allow us to narrate our experience. So um, we'll come back to the issue of how do we get that prefrontal cortex more active so we can really act according to our higher values. For the next slide, um, I'd like us to look at Eric and Lisa. We're going to look at their current relationship, a little, a little history, and family of origin. Eric and Lisa are a composite couple that I made up for out of my own experience clinically and personally for my book. And they, they're woven throughout the book, uh, my book Loving with the Brain in Mind. Um, Eric and Lisa have come alive for me, so I'll share them. It's kind of like writing a novel. And if the next slide, if you can put it up, it would be the genogram of Eric and Lisa while I'm talking about them. Eric and Lisa are a heterosexual Caucasian couple in their 50s. They have two daughters in their mid-20s who have been launched. Lisa's been criticizing Eric forever for not being emotionally present, and Eric has responded defensively to her criticism. Early in their relationship, Lisa turned to her sister Kathy, also a young mother, for emotional support and empathy. So that helped stabilize the relationship, the couple. But Kathy, a year prior to the couple calling me, Kathy was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer and died in six, within six months. Without her sister's support, Lisa can no longer imagine being married to Eric. Eric has resisted couple therapy for many years, but now suddenly he's definitely a serious candidate for therapy because Lisa's talking about leaving him and he doesn't want to end the marriage. Let's talk about the history of their relationship. Lisa was attracted to strong, protective Eric 
unlike Lisa's depressed mother or her alcoholic, verbally abusive father. Eric was attracted to Lisa's positivity and social-emotional intelligence, unlike his critical, controlling mother. When the children were born, especially the second, who was a fussy baby who turned into a somewhat shy, difficult child, Lisa turned more insistently to Eric for partnering around parenting and for emotional support. Eric was focused on his career as an engineer and was unable to provide either to her. He felt out of his empathy in the out of his element in the empathy department and in the emotion department. When Lisa would criticize him, Eric would get defensive or he would withdraw, which left Lisa feeling even more frustrated and alone. This intensified her criticism, which increased his withdrawal and his defensiveness. While this cycle was frustrating for both, it was manageable as long as Kathy was in the picture, offering Lisa the emotional connection she craved. Lisa's relationship with Kathy, stab Kathy stabilized Eric and Lisa's marriage. But when Lisa became ill and died, Eric could not step into her shoes. Lisa was ready to throw in the towel in the relationship. Let's look at their family of origin. So Lisa is a parentified child with a depressed mother and an alcoholic, verbally abusive father. When Lisa feels abandoned by Eric now, her amygdala is sending alarm systems si signals from the past. It feels like she's again with her depressed, abandoning mother. Eric's father died suddenly of a heart attack when he was five. His mother became controlling and overprotective with Eric, her only child. Eric experienced her as highly critical. He tuned out his mother's criticism and avoided her emotionality. His mother was so overwhelmed with her own grief that she didn't attend to Eric's feelings on losing his father. He never got the hang of tuning into his emotions or his grief, his emotions or anyone else's emotions. And as we'll see, his gender socialization didn't help either because the boys in his peer group certainly didn't help him become empathic. Family of origin dynamics are haunting this couple's dance in the present. When Lisa criticizes Eric now for being emotionally unavailable, Eric is flooded with old memories of his mother criticizing him when his father died. Lisa's contempt stirs up Eric's sense of inadequacy and fear of abandonment. Eric withdraws like he did as a child. Eric's withdrawal makes Lisa feel more unprotected and alone, like she felt as a child when her mother would withdraw to her room in depression. Gender training makes the couple's impasse worse. Lisa overfunctions emotionally and socially in the home, as many women do in heterosexual relationships. Eric is underskilled in empathy. He defines himself totally in terms of his work. He's not emotionally resilient and hasn't learned the skills to, quote, be there for Lisa. He never learned empathy skills from his mother or his peer group. So the next slide is Eric and Lisa's vulnerability cycle. In 2004, Michelle Schenkman and I published an article in Family Process called The Vulnerability Cycle, Working with Impasses in Couple Therapy. And this is an example of the vulnerability cycle from Eric and Lisa. We're going to look at this more closely together. But basically what happens is that Lisa is feeling overburdened and unprotected. And so she comes at Eric with criticism and anger. Her vulnerability of, of feeling unprotected and overburdened triggers her survival strategy of criticism, which hits him in his vulnerability of feeling inadequate, which triggers his survival strategy of withdrawing, which makes her feel more alone and they're off to the vulnerability cycle races. And each one is blaming the other in a linear fashion for their impasse. The neurobiology fueling the vulnerability cycle is something I didn't know in 2004, but I'm gonna share it now. Again, as we talked about, we're wired to protect ourselves when we feel attacked, or criticize, that's fight or flight. This happens automatically between beneath awareness. Partners now become a source of danger and alarm with each other, even if there's no physical violence. And the amygdala is registering that danger. So they have to protect themselves from the other. Eric and Lisa's dance of reactivity is automatic beneath awareness. It turns out, as research shows, that we live most of our life on automatic pilot driven by our lower brain. This is actually helpful because the higher brain, the prefrontal cortex, requires a huge amount of energy uh, in the form of glucose to work. Um, so the glucose is, is a limited supply and the body, the brain takes up a huge amount of it, especially the prefrontal cortex. So having the lower brain run most of our lives is actually helpful. It saves energy for the higher brain, but it also gets us in trouble. So the automatic brain is partly the emotional brain. It's also our habitual brain. And both habits and our emotions are often running the show. We're often unaware of what is driving us, but we react nonetheless. Choice is a prefrontal process. We do have a higher brain, the prefrontal cortex, that allows us to choose how to respond rather than acting on automatic pilot. We can take a pause and think about how we want to respond. I do this in my own marriage. Dan Siegel calls this the pause that refreshes. Emotions often overrun thinking. The emotional brain overtakes the higher brain and emotional reactivity goes much faster than the higher brain. So in couple therapy, we want to facilitate choice, challenging automatic reactions, patterns, self-justifications, and facilitating partners' abilities to choose their own behavior more thoughtfully. I give clients specific tools for their toolbox in this regard. 
We slow down the action when the couple gets reactive. There are many therapists who, when couples get reactive with each other, want to tear their hair out or want to not be a couple's therapist because it's so tense. I actually like those moments because those are the moments of impasse where you know there's some rich material to work with and we can be constructed. I help Eric and Lisa step back and identify their reactivity and then identify how they would like their relationship to look. I help them shift from being two victims of each other to being co-authors of their relationship. I, I, I endorse an active rather than a passive view of loving. So when uh, a, a client will say to me, I still love my wife, but I fell out of love with her. I think what's happened is he's missing the hit of dopamine and the, and the jazzy feeling of early love. But that falling out of love is a very passive kind of language. I like to think instead about proactive loving. It's a kind of activist approach to loving. Um, I, ter- I coined the term relational empowerment to look at what we can do to be empowered in our relationships, which involves social and emotional intelligence. It involves self-responsibility and relational responsibility, some responsibility for my own responses, and co-responsibility for how we are co- constructing this relationship. It involves nurturing the we, building intimacy. Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a wonderful Buddhist monk living in France from Vietnam originally, uh, tells a, a very interesting story. He talks about how we should, um, how we all have inside us the seeds of anger and resentment, and we also have inside ourselves the seeds of love and, and compassion. And he encourages us to water the seeds of love and compassion so they will flower rather than the seeds of anger. He calls this selective watering. And he said, and with a couple, it's really important that we water our partner's seeds of love and compassion too. And as he's telling the story in a lecture at at his um, village in France, a couple sitting in the front row and tears are streaming down the wife's face. And after the lecture, the couple comes up to Thich Nhat Hanh and they thank him for the lecture. And he says to the husband, your flower needs watering. And the story that Thich Nhat Hanh tells is that this man went home and became a changed man. So he really took in the idea that he needs to be nurturing the goodness in his wife and not the resentment. Barbara Fredrickson, in a recent book, talked about love as micro moments of positivity resonance. She calls that love 2.0. So in couple therapy, we give, we, we facilitate tools for building and repairing intimacy. How can we deal with moments when we feel threatened and the emotional brain takes over? What happens when, emo- when intimacy is eroded? How can we be more pro- proactive? So let's look at the next slide, which is the goals of couple therapy. So in couple therapy, um, and if you're not a therapist, uh, you know, you can think about your own relationship. I'm sure many of you are anyway. Um, I think it, it's not just them over there. It's, it's all of us are struggling in relationships. So in couple therapy, the first thing we want to do is identify the couple's dance. So in Lisa and Eric's case, it's criticize, withdraw. Look behind the scenes at each partner's reactivity and help them look behind the scenes with curiosity and empath and empathy. We identify the intrapsychic, that's the individual, interpersonal, intergenerational, contextual, and neurobiological factors fueling the dance. We give partners tools to manage their own reactivity and make more thoughtful choices and facilitate empathy, generosity, trust, and intimacy. In therapy, it's important for both to feel safe, to be heard and held, and only then can they be challenged. And by the way, it's also really important that couples on their own be safe at home. I help clients become aware of their automatic reactive patterns and the origins of the patterns, learn to pause before reacting, bring prefrontal thoughtfulness to emotional reactivity, set relationship goals in keeping with their values, and operationalize these values and goals. To move from reactivity to thoughtfulness, from a passive approach to loving, like what are you doing for me lately, to proactive loving. To shift from power struggles to a sense of working together on the relationship. In that, in our article, Michelle Schenkman and I talked about couples' impasses, and then we talked about core impasses. So couples get stuck you know, about different topics. But the core impasses are the ones that are really hot and really repetitive, where couples really feel very stuck. And in these impasses, we have vulnerabilities and survival strategies. When we feel vulnerable as human beings, our survival strategies are automatically triggered to protect us. This happens quickly and beneath awareness. The survival strategies we saw with Eric and Lisa may then trigger our partner's vulnerability, and a vulnerability cycle is triggered. Examples of vulnerabilities are you feel inadequate, abandoned, unlovable, unprotected. Okay, those are the sort of the softer experiences, often of the young child. And we all have them. So I encourage you to think about your own vulnerabilities. And then we also all have survival strategies, how we protect ourselves when our vulnerabilities are triggered. And there's many, many survival strategies, right? So one is be independent, take care of yourself, be responsible, take care of others, be a pleaser, criticize, withdraw, be a caretaker, right? So there's many different uh, varieties of survival strategies. So the next slide is, again, the vulnerability cycle of Eric and Lisa. We'll look at it in a little more depth. So Lisa feels overburdened and unprotected. And she criticizes Eric, right, which makes him feel inadequate and ashamed. This sets off his... And by the way, I think in heterosexual relationships, uh, Gottman 
and others have found that it's often the woman in heterosexual relationships who brings up the problems, and uh, men often feel on the defensive as the woman is complaining or criticizing. Uh, and then many men at that point start to feel inadequate or ashamed. I think that's part of male gender training. So there's a, some gender typical stuff here. I think there's off, it doesn't have to be this way for all couples, obviously. And it could be different for gay and lesbian couples. So then Eric withdraws, which then reactivates Lisa's vulnerability of feeling alone and unprotected. These vulnerabilities and survival strategies stem from their families of origin. Remember that Lisa's father was often drunk and emotionally abusive, her mother depressed and withdrawn. Lisa survived by being over-responsible and trying to protect her sister, Kathy, and also she was very angry at her father and mother. Her vulnerabilities were feeling unprotected and overburdened. Her survival strategies over-functioning, angry resentment. So exactly the things that she felt vulnerable about, vulnerable about as a child, she's now vulnerable about in her marriage, and the survival strategies she used as a child, she's using in her marriage. For Eric's side, his mother became over-controlling and critical after the father died suddenly. Eric would tune out his mother and withdraw to his room, and his mother allowed him to close the door. So Eric learned go to, go, withdrawing is safe. That's what he does with Eric, with Lisa now. His vulnerabilities are feeling inadequate and ashamed. His survival strategies avoidance, what he calls duck and cover, and get defensive. I want to help the couple get meta to their cycle, to look at it from above. I, help, I have them fill in the blank vulnerability cycle diagram with me in the session. It's very fun to do. It's very kind of empowering for the couple. And it externalizes their dance. This is the dance we do as interactional and intrapsychic processes are made visible. The couple looks at their cycle as a team. Their higher brains are, are engaged. Some couples actually put their cycle on the refrigerator. This is the cycle we do together to remind them. We identify the circular recursive nature of the cycle. Intimacy can grow when we can look at that cycle in a gentler way than when they're attacking each other. We note that both are victims of the dance and they're both co-creators of the dance. So it's kind of both. I encourage each partner to notice their vulnerability when it arises and speak from vulnerability. Because when you speak from your vulnerability, it elicits your partner's empathy. That's kind of neuro we're neurobiologically wired for care when someone is vulnerable. But when you speak with from your survival strategy with attack or withdrawal, then fight or flight gets stimulated in your partner. So in, instead of coming at each other with defenses, accusations, etc., we can come to each other with vulnerability and hold each other's vulnerability with care. It's really important. I find in sessions that um, intimacy increases as couples hold each other's vulnerabilities instead of getting caught up in their dueling survival strategies. I encourage clients to grow up their own survival strategy. So for example, Eric learns to take a time out. John Gottman talks about a time out ritual. When you're all flustered and you're flooded and you're in diffuse physiological arousal and you can't think straight, it's not a good idea to try to resolve the problem. You need to take a break and he calls it a take a break ritual. So you take a break of at least 20 minutes. Some people need an hour, some people need a day actually. People are very different this way. But you take that break and then you come back and you take it and you negotiate it so it's not an abandonment. So Eric learns to say, I really want to have this conversation with you and work it out, Lisa, but I can't do it right now. I'm too upset. So I'm going to take a break and let's come back together in such and such a time. And she agrees to that. For her part, Lisa's survival strategy of attack and aggressiveness needs to be softened. And she, I, I help her do bring up her concerns with a softer startup, which John Gottman talks about. And then we help them separate the present from the past and identify what's getting activated from their family of origin. When we don't know how to get through to our partner, we may go to power over behavior or pull away. There's a kind of a hot potato of blame. Some some of my clients will say, it's 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 not me, it's, it's her. <laughs> she's the one who changed and that's why it's better. Or she's the one who has to change. That's why it's bad. But then you're giving away all your power to the other person. And I like to have each person think about what they could have done differently. I will invite blame to leave the office. I'll, 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 it's very important that the therapy office is a shame-free, blame-free zone. And I help clients shift from blame to empathy and self-responsibility. I statements call forth partner empathy. You statements call forth defensiveness. So let's look at power two. The power struggles of the blame game are really power over behavior. I try to make you do what I want. Power two is about being the best person you can be, being your best self, living according to your higher values. So instead of being a victim of your partner or of your, of your own reactivity, you can live according to your values. This involves emotional and social intelligence and loving intentionally. I offer clients tools for your toolbox. Men particularly like the very concrete language of tools, and it, it, it makes therapy less amorphous, less about just feelings, and more like something you can really get empowered in that process. I help couples bring up their concerns. I call it make a relational claim in a way that the other partner can hear, and you can say what you need, but also hold your partner's concerns. 
Emotion regulation is key. We're going to look at that in a minute. When I had a temper as a little girl, I had red hair and a temper. My father taught me this at eight years old. It was a quote from Seneca, the Stoic philosopher from long ago. He said, most powerful is the person who has himself in his own power. So in this regard, power is the power to manage your own reactivity, which I really like. And the middle prefrontal cortex is involved in power too. So let's go deeper into this and look at techniques for emotion regulation. Researchers have looked at this. Self-soothing is really important, so you're not at the mercy of your partner to get it perfectly right. This is what Dan Siegel calls parenting yourself from the inside out. If you can soothe, here's a quote from Siegel and Hartzell. You can give yourself the tools your parents were not able to offer you as a child. In many ways, this is parenting yourself from the inside out. So one very simple technique is just put your hand on your heart and feel the warmth there. And just feel it as a soothing, calming presence, right? I'm not sure if oxytocin is flowing if you're touching yourself, but certainly the warmth of your hand and the intention of calming down can help. Deep, bre- deep belly breathing is very helpful, especially the outbreaths are calming. They activate the parasympathetic nervous system. Identifying your own emotions and naming them is important. Uh, Siegel calls this name it to tame it. Research shows that affect labeling, naming your emotion, I'm upset right now, activates the prefrontal cortex and deactivates the amygdala, calms it down. In order to read your emotions, though, you have to be able to read your body cues. This is a process called interoception, reading inside. And the body cues go from your gut and your heart, your viscera, up your spinal cord, into your brain and the insula, and then ultimately forward to the prefrontal cortex where it's named. There are people uh, who are unable to name their own feelings. They're called, it's called alexithymia. And there are people who speculate that the way we we socialize males, we socialize them for alexithymia, to not be in touch with vulnerable feelings. Eric was certainly in that category. Other imagery techniques, I sometimes ask couples to, uh, a client to imagine their amygdala all riled up when they're upset and imagine their prefrontal cortex coming in to calm them down. Mindfulness meditation is a really important technique for emotion regulation. It strengthens the prefrontal cortex ability to calm the amygdala. Uh, Richie Davidson's research shows that mindfulness meditation builds more connections from prefrontal cortex to amygdala, increases cognitive flexibility, increases immune functioning, well-being, and relationship satisfaction. Reappraisal is another way to calm down. It's similar to reframing. So if my if I see my husband's papers strewn on the kitchen table, I can say to myself, instead of getting angry, I can say my husband didn't leave his papers on the table to annoy me. He's in the middle of a writing project. And then I shift my view of he's doing this to bother me, upset me, or he's in, he doesn't care. I shift to he's a brilliant scholar, and this is one of his writing projects. And then it doesn't bother me so much. So reappraisal is really important. Soothing each other is another technique for emotion regulation. Um, Jim James Cohen has researched the interpersonal regulation of emotion. Um, he had, in a famous study called Lending a Hand, he had a woman lie in an fMRI machine waiting for a shock. And when she held her husband's hand, her anxiety about the shock and her pain at getting the shock was much lessened. When she hold a, held a stranger's hand or no hand, she didn't have that experience. And then a subsequent research project by Jim Cohen and Sue Johnson took a couple that were insecurely attached, uh, gave them, a, and, and the wife got no no boost from holding her husband's hand. And then they did a second, uh, then they did a, the study again after a course of emotionally focused therapy when they were securely attached to each other and the wife got the boost from holding her husband's hand. So this is very lovely research that shows the ways in which therapy can actually change um, the brain and, and how we experience our bodies as well. We want to look at nurturing the we, working as a team, turning towards each other, rather than away from each other or against each other. This is some of Gottman's work and Dan Weil's work. To share relational responsibility, to be the person you want to be in this relationship. Sometimes now, I'm much better with my temper than I was as a child, but sometimes now if I'm going to, if I feel like my temper is starting to rise with my husband, I can stop myself and I say, what impact will my behavior have on my beloved and our relationship? And do I want to be that person? And many times I can actually stop myself from the temper, which is amazing. It's, it's very empowering. Uh, we want empower with to build positivity and to facilitate attachment and couple therapy. And EFT, or emotionally focused therapy, of, of both Sue Johnson and Les Greenberg are really great examples of, of that work. So first of all, we need to learn to read our own emotions. Emotions start as body sensations. As I said before, they come up from the body to the brain. And normally with attuned and responsive parenting, the young child learn, learns how to do this normally. But as I indicated before, many men and some women as well whose parents are not attuned uh, never learn how to do this. And sometimes they need to learn to do that in therapy. Reading our own emotions is crucial for empathy because we actually resonate. One, the first step of empathy is we resonate with the other person and feel in our body what they're feeling, partly through mirror neurons. But we actually, at a non-conscious level, we have that 
that in sync kind of feeling, that's empathy. It's quick and beneath awareness. There's a, a very lovely test called the Reading the Mind Through the Eyes Test. If you haven't seen it, you can go online and find it. It's from Simon Baron Cohen in, in uh, Cambridge in England. And it looks at, it helps people, it helps identify how good you are at reading the emotions. And basically we read emotions around the eyes, the muscles around the eyes, which brings me to eye contact. Remember eye contact when we fall in love? Well, with our devices these days, we often don't look at each other. And what research has shown that empathy has plummeted among college students in the past decades. Cyber cruelty decreases when you can see the eyes of the other person that you might be uh, like tempted to be cruel to. Eye contact is really important and it's a major problem, I think, in couple relationships now. So let's look at facilitating empathy in couple therapy. So Eric needs to learn to read his own body cues. He needs to learn interoception, which I actually help him with. I start with his physical sensations, his gut feelings, his clenched teeth, his clenched fists, etc. With clients who have tempo tantrums, I help them back up from the tantrum, identify the prodromal cues before they get so escalated, the clenched teeth, the rapid heart rate, etc. This is very empowering so you can catch yourself before you actually blow up. I reframe empathy and self-empathy as emotional intelligence and power, which is really helpful for men and people who don't know how to do it. So learning empathy for the other, one of the tried and true methods in couple therapy is the speaker-listener technique, where one speaks and the other with eye contact and the other listens and then summarizes what they heard. Another exercise that I learned from Marsha Linehan is, you sit, is your empathy posture. So if you're sitting, uh, you can't see my hands very well, but if you're sitting with your hands, your fists clenched and you're hunched over, you're not going to be very empathic to what you're hearing. But if you open your hands and open your heart and open your chest, you're going to be in a, in a very different position. And we know from research that the body position changes how we perceive and how we feel. So opening up in that mindfulness pose, I think, is very helpful for empathy. Um, how we speak to the other uh, makes a difference in whether we receive empathy. So that Gottman's found, Gottman found that women with a soft startup are more likely to get their partner's empathy and vice versa. Generally, we think that women are better at, at empathy than men. It's not always the case. And some of this has to do with hormones. A lot of it has to do with socialization. In terms of hormones, oxytocin generally is associated with empathy. It increases empathy. And women have more oxytocin, although both genders have both. And testosterone, with both, which both genders have, but, but men have a lot more, is inversely related to empathy. So there is some biological, I think, wiring here. But socialization is huge in terms of training men away from empathy. My husband and I personally um, worked to, to teach our sons actively how to be empathic human beings and has served them very well in life. They're terrific fathers and husbands. Sometimes when I'm teaching, let's say, Eric how to get the hang of empathy and he's kind of wooden in the beginning, Lisa gets very agitated and very impatient and that's not helpful. So I really work with him about that. I work with blocks to empathy. Um, if one is defensive, you can't really be empathic. Some people who are guilty and, they, and that blocks the empathy. I feel bad for you, i.e. empathic, means I'm bad because I hurt you. So we need to work around that. People who are imperious or rigid or unopened to the other person are certainly not going to be empathic. Um, having good, good boundaries is really important because if you lose yourself in the other person's feelings, then empathy kind of goes out the window. Happy couples turn toward each other a great deal. And touch, massage, and sex are really important components of intimacy and happy relationships. They all release oxytocin and bond couples to each other. Many unhappy couples don't have sex at all and don't touch each other. They're deprived of oxytocin's magic healing powers. And if they don't do empathy either or hugging, then they really are kind of bereft. Gratitude is really important in relationships. We need to appreciate the blessings in the relationships. Gottman found that unhappy couples miss 50% of their partner's positive behaviors. Taking each other for granted is so easy in a long-term relationship and so problematic. Some couples have what they call a blessings jar, and they jot down on a post-it note or a little note positive things they note that their partner did, and they put it in the jar. And then once a year, for in some couples it's Thanksgiving, they take out the notes and they read it to each other. So what they're doing is looking for the positive. That's really important. Love, as I said before, isn't just a steady state of connection. It involves connection, disconnection, or hurt, and repair. Apology is really important in relationships. Scottman found that happy couples repair a lot. Or as we, I would like to say, love means having to say you're sorry a lot. Um, apology is about self-responsibility, not finding who's the bad guy right? So it's not about being one down when you apologize. I, I frame apology as actually empowerment. As I said before, you need to repair when you're calm. 
Uh, when you're on the low road, when you're on that amygdala-driven meltdown, you really can't repair very well. So you want to take time to calm down. Repair can in increase intimacy. If you take responsibility, it can really increase intimacy and hear your partner's pain. Some couples have much more severe wounds, not the daily stuff, but toxic ruptures, you know, affairs, other violations of trust, etc. And repairing them is really important. Sue Johnson has written some very interesting work on this. It's very important. And, and Les Greenberg has as well. If the partner says, "Why it was years ago, why, why can't you get over it? That's not helpful because uncomforted trauma is the worst kind of trauma. So finding ways to connect around the pain is really important. The family of origin, as I've sort of been suggesting, affects us in our current relationships. William Faulkner famously said, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past, okay? The past lives on inside us. Uh, we know that trauma uh, affects our brains and that b implicit memory from the earliest years stays with us even if we don't explicitly remember what happened. I made up a term called living under the spell of childhood when you're feeling like an angry child towards your parents and you're waiting for them to wake up and give you what you need. And they never do right? And then you're caught in this spell of resentment and blame. And then often you carry that into your current couple relationship, which is really problematic. So I help clients wake from the spell of childhood and work, do some healing work with their family of origin. On the one hand, we're creatures of habit. We, in our brain, are, you know, billions of neurons and, and there are circuits of neurons that are connected through synapses, through synaptic connections. And there are trillions of synaptic connections in the human brain. Through the repetition of habit, the circuits of neurons get wired together. As Heb Serum says, neurons that fire together wire together. The stronger the habit, the stronger the circuit of neurons. The stronger the circuit of neurons, the stronger the habits. Everything you do changes your brain. You are what you do. So be careful what you do. Your habits really matter. But we're also creatures of change. We know that experience changes the brain. Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for finding this out. And we know now, whereas they used to think that neuroplasticity was only in childhood, we know now that neuroplasticity can continue throughout life, but it needs to be nurtured in adulthood. And some of the things that foster neuroplasticity are exercise, physical exercise to get blood flowing to the brain, paying attention, being aware, not on automatic pilot, and learning new things, pushing the envelope. Long-term love and change in adulthood takes work and focus. Let's look at the position of a therapist. And it's important to create a safe space for couple intimacy. The therapist is not a judge. We need to hold both people equally. We side with partners' strengths and resources and challenge their, their unproductive behaviors. I work transparently and collaboratively. I facilitate change. I don't take responsibility for change. Uh, Carol Dweck wrote a wonderful book called Mindset, and she talked about growth mindset, the orientation to grow, and fixed mindset, the sort of I am what I am. And it's really important to help couples grow. I like to encourage Monday morning quarterbacking as we revisit a fight that happened in the past. We revisit the script. What could I have done differently in this vignette? And then I help couples make a different choice in the moment. I call this the fork in the road. So I'll give you an example, uh, and I'm almost ready to stop. So in this example, Eric has considered moments when Lisa is critical of him for not helping enough in the house or being there for her, and then he gets defensive, and he's worked really hard to try not to get defensive. So he comes to therapy and he tells the following story. They were in the laundry room and Lisa was doing the laundry and she was really angry at him for not helping enough. And he started to feel that defensiveness bubbling up and he calmed himself down. He took a few deep breaths, which calmed him down. And he said, Lisa, I think you're really upset and overwhelmed. Tell me what I can do to help. And he said, she melted in my arms. And this is a, actually a true story from one of my clients. So that issue of he, he saw the fork in the road, he could go down that old reactive defensive pattern uh, path or he could go down the new path. Resistance is common in therapy, and I honor resistance as a communication to me that people are holding onto their survival strategies. So the last slide, looking at change in the dance and in the self. As couples develop new dances that support intimacy, they're developing new neural pathways. Thanks to neuroplasticity, this is possible, but because it's harder in adulthood, it takes a lot of repetition for new behaviors to take hold. We need to do what's called masked practice. And with time, practicing over and over again, the new pathways will become automatic and wired into the brain. But the old pathways seem to hang around. And when you're tired or stressed or sick, your, your, old, path, your old pathways may come roaring back and your old habits. These are setbacks. And we can predict that with clients. Maintaining change is really important. It's a proactive process. Um, I encourage couples to do rituals and reminders to nurture intimacy. Basically, the bottom line, and with this I'll end, is that love needs to be nurtured every day if it is to survive and thrive. So thank you, and I'm open to conversation or questions now. Terrific. Thank you so much. So do couples know when they need therapy? And what happens if one of them is saying they should go and the other one is saying, no, nah, I don't think we should? 
there are many couples who wait until it's very, very late. Like Eric and Lisa, they waited till Lisa was about to divorce him. It's always delightful to me when a couple comes like proactively early in their relationship. Sometimes couples come even before they get married or move in together because they want to make sure they work out the kinks uh, in the process. If one person is saying, I'm really unhappy, I want us to go to therapy, it's smart for the other person to go because it, it's, you know, it, it's not a win-lose in therapy, right? You know, you, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold my, my ground and I'm going to win and I'm gonna, not going to let you prevail upon me. Because in fact, within, in a marriage or in a close relationship, if one person is unhappy, the relationship is not a success. So a lot of people are hesitant to go to therapy. It's often men, not always, but often, because they think of therapy as a place for women or weak people or crazy people. As opposed to, as I look at it, it's a place for empowerment. It's a place to look at how you can make your relationship better. So I really encourage it. Now, I, I once, uh, usually uh, more and more these days, um, men are calling for couples therapy, heterosexual couples, not just the women. But back in the day when it was always the woman who called and the man didn't want to come, I would say to her, or if she wanted me, I'd talk to him and I would say, you know, your wife wants to come to couple therapy to change the relationship. If I were you, I'd want to come and, ha come and have a say in how that relationship is going to look. And most men would come right away from that point of view because it was about empowerment. They're going to have a say in the relationship. A lot of people who are afraid of therapy think it's kind of all loosey-goosey, emotional, or scary. Um, so I try to help people kind of have a more of a, of a sense of reassurance when they come in. But I think it's important for both to come in if possible. Earlier you mentioned research about how empathy has plummeted among college students in the past decade. So I'm guessing this will create more narcissists in the population and from there some would be coupled. So what kind of couple therapy would you give to someone that might be in love with a narcissist? So I, I can't give you know specific advice to a specific person, but I would say that we all need to be careful about protecting ourselves in a relationship. I don't know what it means to be a narcissist. I think there are people who are flagrantly narcissistic and cruel and uh, insensitive to another person. And in general, that's not a good sign in terms of getting into a relationship. But sometimes people are what we call narcissistically injured. They get wounded and then maybe they lash out and in ways that can be challenged and actually dealt with, let's say, in therapy. Um, but no, I don't think we should ever drop our security concerns. I think we should also be always be watching uh, and making sure, especially earlier in, in a relationship, and make sure that we're, be, we're safe and we're being treated with respect. What advice would you give to a couple where, let's say, one of them is kind of lashing out and, you know, we're supposed to be watching for threat, but at the same time, we're to be creating space for vulnerability. So I think that um, often when a person is lashing out or is self-centered, um, criticism, it doesn't bring out the best in the person, but certainly a softer, you know, asking what's bothering them or what's hurting them might be a more successful approach. Um, so in, it's a delicate balance between protecting yourself on the one hand and being open to your partner on the other hand. But if you're assessing whether to be in a relationship and you get a pit in your stomach that this person really doesn't care about you and they're only caring about themselves, that's a kind of a red flag, I would think. On the other hand, in any relationship, you may feel that your partner is self-centered or isn't tuning into your needs. That happens, I think, in all relationships. So it's really a matter of learning how to, to read the cues so that you're not putting yourself in danger because that's never what we want to be doing. But you're also able to both speak up for yourself and protect yourself, but also be there for your partner. And to have the kind of partner who you can relax with, that's important. So let's say a couple is looking for relationship counseling or couples therapy. What steps would they take to be able to go about finding a good therapist? Like what makes somebody a good match for them that's going to help them with their problem and give them all kinds of solutions that improves the relationship overall? So I think that it's important to find out um, who, you know, your therapist background, what their training is. It's hard to find a good therapist. I think that sometimes the best way is through word of mouth, but it's also important to understand, to find out what your therapist's uh, credentials are. Many therapists have a website so you can see what their philosophy is. Um, you can ask them about their philosophy. There are more and more of us who are in integrating interpersonal neurobiology into our work, but we're not the majority. So I think you want a therapist who has good training, good solid training, a good reputation. It's always helpful if more than one person recommends a therapist or a doctor for that matter. And then the other thing is to go to a session initially as a sort of trial session, an initial session, and see if it feels that that person really understands you. When I see new clients, I first talk with them on the phone to see whether it's going to be a good fit because I'm not the best therapist for everybody. I And then I refer them if I'm not. I we then meet once and if that feels helpful, we then negotiate 
two more meetings. So we have kind of three sessions during which we can assess, is this going to be a good working relationship or not? Uh, and that would be true somewhat on the therapist side, but mostly on the client side, because if you're sitting there and you feel your therapist doesn't get you, or you have a pit in your stomach that just doesn't feel like a good experience, then that's really important. You know, and some people like, I'm, I'm a pretty active therapist. Um, some people like an act, many people prefer active therapists these days. Some people like a quieter therapist. Some people like a man, some people like a woman. So um, it really depends what you're looking for. And, uh, and certainly I think checking into your therapist background is important. And what kind of advice would you suggest to couples where one of them is like a hothead or maybe both of them or they just have very passionate blowouts and they're not really into having this nicey talk where they're talking about where they're feeling vulnerable or abandoned because their emotions overrun them. So in those kinds of scenarios and those kind of couples, what would you suggest for them? And again, I'm not offering specific advice to a specific person, but in general, there are people who are more passionate fighters and there are people who are more quiet fighters or don't fight much at all. Um, as I said before, Gottman found that, that even happy couples fight, but they, they fight in a way that honors the vulnerability and the care of each other. So I would say that um, the, the, the anguish or the uh, anger from the past, it could be the past from family of origin, but it could also be the past from the relationship. Like you're not paying attention to me. Like you haven't paid attention to me. And then you list all the times they didn't pay attention to you. That sort of, again, it's the amygdala revving up all those feelings. And I think it's important to try to calm down so that you can express your hurt. So here's the deal. I have this mantra behind an angry person is a hurt person, right? There's the hurt mm -hmm. that's fueling the anger. So if there's a, that passionate outflow of, um, all the times you hurt me in the past, probably that hasn't been heard sufficiently in the past. And ultimately anger wants to be heard and it wants to be held because the anger ultimately beneath the anger is the hurt or below the anger is the hurt. So people may say things they don't mean or they may hurt each other when they're when they're intense. And it may be that there's two people with redheaded tempers, right? I didn't marry someone with a redheaded temper, but you can certainly do that. Uh, the question is, number one, do you repair and how quickly do you repair and how thoroughly do you repair? I think it's really important. Um, how much can you hold the vulnerability in a kind way, which as I said before, increases intimacy and increases trust. And the other thing I guess I would add is that for me personally, and I can't speak for every passionate fighter or every person with a temper, I find it really important to work on my temper, to really try to do that deep breathing, identify when I'm getting upset, take a pause, et cetera, so I can then come to my partner in a more sort of emotionally intelligent way. What's something that you would suggest for couples that are perhaps feeling a sense of shame and blame around the house? What can they do to be able to adjust their environment or create some type of emotional regulation strategy so that when they're home, they can at least feel like there's some sense of sanctuary there. So, so I start, you know, with my office as a shame-free, blame-free zone. I, I had a couple once who the wife accused the husband of never talking to her at home. And in my office, he opened up and she said, why do you open up in Mona's office? And he said, because here I don't feel shamed or blamed. That was really important. I work really hard. So if shame or blame pop up in a session, I flag it right away. And I make it clear that that's not what my space is about. It's a kind of sacred space therapy. You know, people are opening up and we want to be able to create that space at home. So I sometimes will ask couples to identify a particular couch or a particular pillow that they identify as their shame-free, blame-free zone that they can go to it. And it's, it's an agreed upon sort of signal and it's a nonverbal signal, right? So it bypasses the, 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 the talking brain or the fight or whatever. And it goes right to, it's, it's a reminder. It's a ritual reminder of this is who we want to be. We want to be people who can connect in a safe way with each other and process our issues. So that's, that's how I would do that certainly. And, and if couples are feeling unsafe in a, in an invite, in a fight, uh, again, a timeout is really important, but I, I want to reiterate that the timeout is not an abandonment. You're not running away. Like when Eric would abandon Lisa, would, would, would withdraw, he would run away and slam the door for good measure, which was for her a real abandonment. But when he said to her, you know, I really am overwhelmed right now. I want to take that break so we can come back. That's a very different kind of conversation. So I really encourage that people create that shame-free, blame-free, and rage-free <laughs> zone in their, in their own lives. And it's an active process. It's ongoing. We all have emotions. We have to regulate them. And how would you carry over your couple therapy skills over into friends or colleagues or family or just the other people in our lives? Um, I have this mantra called take the best and leave the rest. <laughs> and take the best and leave the rest is a kind of acceptance position that you understand that this friend 
or this sibling or this parent or this colleague or your spouse or your child <laughs> is not going to give you everything you need. It's not going to act exactly in accordance with your desires all the time. And that you want to be able to not get so agitated when they do what they do. They just do their own thing. So I think it's really important to have a perspective of what it is you love about the person Accept the disappointments. I mean, you may want to raise, sometimes you want to raise a concern and actually talk it through with someone and have a conversation. Sometimes you may not. I mean, it's not always the case with friends or with colleagues that you want to process everything like you might want to do with a spouse. But I think that issue of having perspective and, um, and having a kind of sense of acceptance is really important so that you're not fussing over everything that goes wrong in your life. I think the, the, the I know that Sounds True does a lot of um, Buddhist presentations uh, and mindfulness, and I think that mindfulness is really important in that regard. What can you share with us that are ways to heal insecure attachments in relationships? I think that um, Sue Johnson's work and Les Greenberg's work are really key in this. And Sue Johnson really talks a lot about how couples come at each other with sort of strong emotions. It's what Michelle Shankman and I call our survival strategies. And that what we want is to help them bring their softer emotions forward, what we would call their vulnerabilities. There's a lot of overlap between Sue Johnson's work and, and my work, and um, and I really I really appreciate her work and Greenberg's work because I think it's really important to be able to trust your partner with your vulnerable self. And but if you if you grew up in a home where you were anxiously attached and you're anxiously attached now to your partner, or you grew up with which is Lisa, let's say, or you grew up in a home where you were avoidantly attached, where you shut down emotions like Eric did, and you do that now in your marriage, it's very hard to do that now. My sense is that that the effectiveness of emotionally focused therapy comes from the experiences of intimacy when your vulnerabilities are being held, when the softer emotions are being held. And it's much easier for your partner to hold your softer emotions than the harsher emotions. The harsher emotions evoke a fight or flight response from the partner. And the softer emotions evoke a kind of care response or curiosity. That's what we want to facilitate in that kind of therapy. So it's it's a piece of work. It's not like overnight work, but it's I think it's it's very, very beautiful work when it when it happens. What kind of suggestions would you give to someone who's thinking of perhaps improving the relationship, but they're also worried that it might cause it to break? In general, I think that um, if you get if we get um, signals that we're not being well loved or well taken or well um, regarded in a relationship. Um, we are entitled to be in a better relationship and there's two options. One is to try to make this relationship better and sometimes therapy is the way to go with that or discussing it with our partner. Um, and sometimes it means we need to leave the relationship and that can be scary. I'm not sure that's what the, what the writer, what the caller was talking about, but certainly, um, the fear of being alone. Some people are afraid to leave a relationship because they don't have the financial independence to leave. So, for example, many women who are financially dependent on their husbands, uh, it's now often the reverse, but, you know, don't have the wherewithal to financially stand on their own two feet, and so they're stuck in the relationship. But being in a relationship based on fear, I think, does set up problems. So I, I really try to help couples and, and individuals make choices so they can be their best self in a good, healthy relationship. And in your couples therapy work and research, what has it shown in regards to same-sex couples? So it's really interesting. Um, the literature shows that same-sex relationships tend to be happier than heterosexual relationships. Um, and partly that's because they tend to not fall into gender-specific traditional norms, you know, where let's say the woman takes care of the house and the kids and the husband works, at least in the old days, um, or the woman is the social emotional expert. Uh, in same-sex relationships, everything has to be negotiated. And so equality is much higher. And certainly in Western cultures, and certainly in America, in the United States, uh, equality is a very high predictor of, uh, of couple satisfaction. So the research suggests that, that same-sex couples actually have, can, can often have happier relationships. Um, some of that, that may be skewed because when the research was done, um, gays and lesbians were not able to marry. And marriage can be a sort of um, legal structure that can help people or hold people in longer than they might want to be in and make it harder to leave, which is could be helpful at times, but it can also be problematic. So it's unclear whether that will hold once with that we have that same research with, with gay and lesbian couples who are married. Um, 
but the issue I think is, is equality and choice and respect. I think that's really important. Um, I think in terms of all the other things I've talked about, the emotional brain, emotion regulation, uh, love needs to be nurtured over time, proactive loving. I think that's true for all people. I don't think that's different for same sex or heterosexual couples. And what can you tell us about monogamy? I know we don't really see it too much in the real world, not even in the animal kingdom, with the exception of perhaps the prairie wolves, which you've mentioned on a different talk. So, uh, but I think even they kind of cheat around a little bit. So I'm wondering if you could share some of your insights that you found in your couples therapy in regards to monogamy and how people can, can make it work and, and what they're doing. So that's a great question. Monogamy is, is really hard. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, partly it's hard because uh, difference and newness is very sexually enticing and exciting. Uh, and long-term relationships become less so. But basically, with the, let, me, let me just sum, summarize the research on the prairie voles. So prairie voles are these little critters that live in, the, in southern Illinois, and actually Sue Carter started some of this research in, when she was at the University of Illinois, and she was out there looking at the prairie voles. And she found that the prairie voles, unlike other voles, like the montane voles, um, are monogamous for life. They, they mate with a partner, and often when one partner dies, they don't even remate. They, they really just are loyal to that one partner. And they wanted to know what was it about these prairie voles that was different from the other voles. Voles are the, these little rodents. And so, first of all, they found that prairie voles are biparent, offer biparental care. They both take care of the children together, which is really interesting. But also that in the prairie voles' brains, the, the oxytocin and vasopressin receptors, which, which are bonding hormones, vasopressin is a cousin of oxytocin. It's more, it's more prevalent in the male brain. So vasopressin and oxytocin bonding hormones. And the, the receptors for them in the prairie voles are actually in the reward centers of their brain. So it feels good for prairie voles to bond. So that's the bond, okay? They've got this nice bond, nice monogamy, nice kids, everything's nice, except that there is some, not a lot, I don't think, but a fair amount of cheating on the side, sexual <laughs> cheating. So there's social monogamy and there's sexual monogamy, okay? Which in some cultures, uh, you know, I think in France that's the case, I think in Brazil it's the case, that you've got your family life and then you've got sort of, a, if you're a man, you've got a mistress on the side. And basically you're, you're supposed to be very discreet. You know, that's not my cup of tea, but for, in some cultures, that's kind of how it works. But the, the prairie voles are, are, some of them are cheating on the side. They also found with birds, um, birds are, are thought to be, most animals are not monogamous. But there are very few numbers are. Among, the, among them are the prairie voles. Uh, among them are sort of us <laughs> sometimes. And among them are birds. Birds are 90% monogamous. But even with birds, they found that when they looked at the DNA of the eggs and of the parents, they found that 90% of the time, I think it was 90% of the time, there were, or some, 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 some high percentage of the time, there was evidence that there had been cheating on the side. They call this extra pair couplings or EPCs. And the main thing was that, that it was important that the female not be caught cheating because um, then the male might not help her with the babies. Again, in these couples where they're mono so-called monogamous, they provide bioparental care. They both have to take care of the babies. And bird baby birds have a very high metabolism. They need a lot of food. So one parent is always fi f flying to get food while the other parent is feeding the babies. So that's the prairie voles. You know, in terms of, of adults, um, I think probably there are differences in terms of how monogamous people tend to want to be or are by nature. Some, um, some of this may be from their family experiences, what they've seen growing up. There does seem to be at least it was at least one article some time ago about a, a variation. I think it was in the vasopressin gene that, uh, in, that predicted whether men would be monogamous or not. So there may be some genetic predisposition to monogamy uh, as well in humans, but it's hard. It's hard to maintain. If someone was thinking about getting married and having children and perhaps seeing a, a pre-marriage counselor or perhaps going into some type of marriage therapy, what type of skills should they develop in a marriage when transitioning from being a couple to becoming parents? That is a great question. And I think thinking about it again proactively is really, really important. So when you're alone as a couple, especially early on, you're focused on each other, that you've got just the two of you, maybe you've got your work or whatever, or your friends or family, but basically you, you really have a lot of energy for each other. When a baby is born, the baby is a nonstop attention seeker and not in a manipulative way. It's just the baby needs literally to, to survive. The baby needs parents to attend to it. And, um, Parents are often deprived of sleep. Uh, their sex life often is put on hold, partly because of recovery from the birth, but partly because they don't have time or energy. And they can become not their best selves because to be your best. Remember, I said earlier that when you're tired or 
ill or whatever, you're stressed, you're, you may forget some of your better behaviors. That's certainly true when, when people are parents. So the research shows that having children can definitely affect couple satisfaction, but it doesn't have to. I think a lot of people are looking at how do you proactively nurture your relationship even when there are, are kids involved. And one thing I think that's really important is for both parents to take care of the child, not just the mother, assuming it's a heterosexual couple or any couple. There's a, there was a, I often get my wisdom from New Yorker cartoons. There, there was a New Yorker cartoon some years ago that showed a mother nursing her baby and the father was looking forlornly in at the doorway with a pacifier in his mouth, <laughs> right? So he's jealous. He's left out of the magic circle. She's now bonded with this new creature. And, and mothers and babies are bonding through oxytocin. That's part of the process. And, you know, it was oxytocin was the couple's, you know, realm. And now it's the mother and baby's realm. But research shows that if the father does hands-on care of the baby, the father and baby bond also, and the father's oxytocin level is it rises. There's really interesting research from um, the Philippines from a longitudinal study, I'll say this very quickly, which is that uh, they studied men who were not partnered, and then the men, and they, and they found out who got the gals, these were heterosexual, and the guys with the high testosterone got the girls, okay? They were sexy. Then they, had, then they got partnered, they didn't get married, but they were partnered, and then they had a baby, and the men who had a baby, their testosterone levels dropped, and the more they took care of their baby, the testosterone level dropped, because you can't be an aggressive, driving person with a little baby, you've got to be soft and empathic. So fathers need to really, it's not like they're going to lose their testosterone, but they need to balance it with more oxytocin by really being hands-on with the baby. So it's a joint project. I think that could really build intimacy in the couple. And also to not forget to take care of your couplehood because people like, first they do the, the kid, then they do the laundry, then they do the bills and their work, and then there's no time for the couple. That's a problem. We really need to make room for the couple relationship proactively and intentionally. And what advice would you give to the single people that are looking to develop their skills and get into a fulfilling relationship? So I think that the habits that I'm talking about of emotion regulation, empathy, etc., are human habits that are good for the individual, for the couple, for intergenerational family relationships. I would say, and in all relationships, I would say the other thing that I don't have time to really go into today, but that I highlighted, is the importance of working through your old issues from your family of origin. Whether you're an individual or in a couple, it's really, really important. It is so liberating to grow up, quote unquote, your relationship with your parents and your siblings and not be stuck in the past, not be stuck with old resentments, not be stuck as the child. So I think developing skills of emotional empowerment and waking from the spell of childhood would be the most important tools that I would recommend for us in all relationships. All right. Thank you so much. And for everybody listening and watching, thank you so much also for staying to the end. And if you're interested in learning more about how to find a therapist, or if you're thinking of going for couples therapy online, perhaps, there is a link in the top right corner of this video. And there's also a link below to therapists online along with a link to Mona's book, which is called Loving with the Brain in Mind. And if you like more of this content, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment below to let us know what parts you found the most valuable so that others can enjoy those scenes as well. And thank you again for watching reprogrammingmind.com. Bye for now.